Hi, welcome to the Sigma Path. In this episode, I'm going to do another product review for you guys, and I'm really excited about this one. I've been waiting to do this for quite some time. These are the SM200 series real-time spectrum analyzers from Signal Hound, which go from 100 kHz to 20 GHz. Now with the addition of SM200C, we have 10 gigabit Ethernet directly built into the unit, which means you can connect this with fiber to a computer even kilometers away and get a full 160 MHz IQ streaming. These instruments are ridiculously fast, as we will see when we're doing our experiments. So we're going to take them apart, take a look, reverse engineer them a little bit, understand how they work internally, and then I have a whole bunch of experiments to talk about the software, some of the measurements, and what these things are capable of. So let's take a look at the Signal Hound SM200B and 200C here side by side. Both of these are 100 kHz to 20 GHz real-time spectrum analyzers. The build quality is fantastic. Uh, it's really nice to see precision machine excellent thermal solution built like a rock. Some of the best definitely I've seen in the lab in terms of the quality and a lot of effort has been put into the mechanical design of this instrument. In fact, you can buy an option for these which extends the temperature range of operation to from minus 40 degrees Celsius to 65 degrees Celsius if you want to, obviously intended to be used in harsh environments, so that's taken into account in the mechanical design. In terms of the RF performance, they're essentially identical. The only difference between these two units is how they interface to the PC and what limitations there are with that interface. So on the SM200B, we have a USB 3.0 here, and because of the maximum amount of data you can push through this, you are limited to 40 megahertz of instantaneous IQ streaming after all the corrections are done, of course. But in order to take advantage of the 160 megahertz of band that this thing is capable of, it does have a built-in two seconds worth of DDR memory. So you can capture two seconds in real time and then offload that. So you're gonna have to pause the acquisition while that transfer is happening to the PC. On the 200C, the USB 3 interface has been replaced with an SFP Plus compatible 10 gigabit ethernet, which means that now you can do full corrected IQ streaming at 160 megahertz of instantaneous bandwidth on the SM200C. This unit is a few thousand dollars more expensive, but if you need that IQ streaming at 160, this is definitely my favorite instrument. You've put a lot of effort to enable that, and you can do so much because of this. Now, if you look at the front panel, they're essentially identical otherwise. We have power input, RF input, of course, GPS trigger, 10 megahertz reference, and both of them have GPIOs, which you can control through the API, and we will talk about that. You can program them, you can do antenna switching, let's say, or you can do triggering GPIOs. You're fully really in your control with the software. So this is designed for you to write your own code on top of it, even though it has a very nice GUI interface uh, that comes with it. We will take a look at that as well. So it's hard to really find anything uh, wrong with these things from a mechanical point of view. The only complaint I had is that there's no power switch on these things, no soft or hard power switch, so the only way to turn them off is to unplug them. Now for bench use, that's a little bit inconvenient, but I also understand that for field use, you plug these in and you leave them because they have OCXOs and GPS discipline OCXOs, and you don't want to really power them on and off. It's just for lab, it would be nice to have it. Now in terms of performance, as I said, they're identical, and they both give you that extraordinary terahertz per second, one terahertz per second of sweep rate, which is crazy. And that happens all the way down to 30 kilohertz of resolution bandwidth. In fact, these instruments sweep so fast and the LO switches so fast that they push right up against ITAR regulation. If you want to make these any faster, they will be ITAR classified and you would need a clearance to even purchase them. So really as fast as they can be. If you push the resolution bandwidth down to 10 kilohertz, then they do 160 gigahertz per second, and at 1 kilohertz, 18 gigahertz per second, which is really, really fast. So finding interference, finding events that are very rare, and capturing them and storing them is going to be so much easier because of the sweep rate across the entire 100 kilohertz to, 200, uh, to 20 gigahertz, of course. In terms of phase noise, they're also quite good for an instrument of this size, and because of the OCXO and the PLL design, it's all custom done by Signal Hunt inside these. We're looking at, at 1 kHz offset, minus 123 dBc per hertz at a 1 GHz signal, and at 1 MHz is minus 133 dBc per hertz. In terms of noise, they're also quite good. We are looking at a disparate average noise level about minus 160 dBm, around about 2.7 GHz or so, and it goes all the way up to minus 149 dBm when you're at 20 gigahertz. So really quite good. The noise figure of this instrument must be around it's less than 20 dB all the way up to 20 gigahertz, which is again quite good. And we will see the teardown, how that's done and how that's built internally. 
Now, because of the built-in GPS and OCXO, when the GPS is locked, you're going to get plus or minus 5 times 10 to the minus 10 part per million accuracy with the GPS assistance, which is, again, very important if you want to get absolute frequency measurements when these things are installed in the field. One thing you do have to watch out for is that the input here is rated to only 20 dBm unlike most spectrum analyzers which are rated to 30 dBm or 1 watt. And as a result, I'd like to see them perhaps maybe ship with an attenuator or, or something or a coupler just so that people are maybe a little bit more aware that this is 20 dBm. It does say it, right, of course, right over here, but if you're coming from an instrument that's rated to 1 watt, you may be uh, easy to damage this if you're not careful. But there is a compromise to be made, of course, between the noise and the linearity and how much power you want to do, how much attenuation you want to have. So this is a compromise that they have chosen, which is okay for most time. You just have to be a little bit careful. So this instrument is made of two main PCBs. One PCB has all the RF components on it, and another PCB has the FPGA as well as some of the synthesizers, which we will take a look at next. Now, if you look at this overall system, before we get into the details, if you wanted to design something like this, where you can support a terahertz per second sweep, at the same time as good phase noise, good linearity, and good uh, harmonic suppression, that would be pretty tough to do, because you're not using a pre-selector like a traditional spectrum analyzer, because you're dealing with 160 megahertz instantaneous bandwidth. So the design is very different. And how would you do it? Well, let's see how they have done it. And I think this is a very interesting architecture. So let's try it from the RF input. Now, the very first thing we see here is a switch. This is a PSEMI 42522 switch, and this splits the band into two. So in order to emulate the behavior of a pre-selector, the input is basically going to have to be split into many different bands, filtered, and then recombined. So these bands are quite a bit more coarse than a pre-selector would give you. So there's a lot of coordination here in order to jump between these bands, filter them, combine them again, and then do IQ conversion. So you can see once we split this into two, this top part is the lower frequency, kind of sub 10 gigahertz, and the bottom part is the over 10 gigahertz, so between 10 to 20 gigahertz, and it's just the very first switch that has the highest frequency, of course, it has to have. So if you look over here at the very top, these are the lower frequency bands. And this is where we use SMD components to filter different bands because you can use lumped components when the frequency is low, in a couple of gigahertz, let's say. As you go further down, you can see there's markings on the PCB indicating that there are other filters. And these filters are, of course, embedded on the PCB, but because they're in between the layers, you can't see them. In fact, I took an x-ray of this just to see where those filters are and what they look like. But because there is so much metal in this board, even at 35 kilovolt, which is the highest energy my X-ray machine can do, you can barely see those traces. Now, this, having these uh, filters in between the layers has a lot of advantages. First of all, it isolates them from each other quite well, because you can completely shield them from top and the bottom in their own little Faraday cage, basically. You can also partially overlap them, making the board smaller. So you can imagine what a nightmare the EM design of this board is, because you have to simulate a lot of these together to capture their interaction, capture how they work together. So the design of this front end has to consider the linearity, the spurious uh, effects of all these different filters, where you choose the frequencies. It's quite impressive how much stuff is actually crammed into this tiny area. So once you split the signal uh, with all these switches, these are all different switches, and you recombine them back with an identical switch. So you split them and you recombine them, and there are various amplifiers. There's one here. There are digital attenuators to control the dyna dynamic range of the signal, prepare them for the mixers, and so on. In the lower frequency part, we have two mixers. We have a mixer over here. This is an IQ mixer, ADL5387. And there's another one here, ADL5380, I believe. And these are just IQ mixers. And of course, this is an IQ streaming instrument. So all the mixers are going to be IQ mixers. Over here, we have a dual digital gain amplifier. These are typically used to drive ADCs. This is to basically meet the full-scale dynamic range of the ADC and recondition the signal and put a gain control on it. It's interesting to see that there's two of them. There's one over here and there's one over here. Somehow they must be able to switch between them or the purpose of this might be something else because these are the only connectors I see going to the other board. So it's a bit of a mystery how they handle these two different IQ paths. At the same time, we have a lot of these transformers everywhere, these white boxes that you see. These are mostly for single and differential conversion. So now let's look at the higher frequency part, which is dealt with a little bit differently. So the yellow signal of these mixers are going to come from here, and I'll talk about that. But the yellow signal for the higher frequencies is going to have to have some multiplication in it in order to meet the frequency requirements, because the yellow coming over here isn't, doesn't go up to 20 gigahertz. So over here, you can see we have actually a three-way, or I should say a four-way pin diode 
chip scale package here, there's one over here, there's one over here, so you can see everything down here has to have much higher frequency response, so these are quite a bit more expensive components that they have to be used, and they're much smaller. Lots of different filters, you can see different filters labeled here, some of them are on the top level, so you can even see the different traces. We go over here and they recombine again, so they split, filter, 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 recombine back over here in the same uh, pin switch it uh, appears to be. And then we go over here, this is a, an attenuator, digital attenuator, then we got two amplifier stages, and we have some more of these pin selectors or splitters, I should say, where they split again and recombine. Here's another path, another one, another one, different filters. And over here, this is another switch, and right here is our Hittite, or I should say analog devices. I keep saying Hittite to this because that's what I got used to. This is an HMC 8191, and over here we have another one, HMC uh, 5520A. Both of these are IQ mixers. They're just at different frequencies. Again, highly optimized for the band of the filter that they're connected to. Uh, we have a doubler here. This is a mini circuits KSX2-24. That's our one doubler here. And I believe there is another doubler here. Now I can't seem to find where the other one is. But the LO signal coming over here gets doubled here in order to meet the frequency response of this one. So this is must be our 20 gigahertz mixer, and this is our 10 gigahertz mixer or so. We have another switch over here. Now, here's the interesting part. Because you're filtering the entire RF, that's just part of the problem. You also have to have a really clean LO. Every time you multiply or every time you split the LO, you have to filter it again because the higher harmonics can land in the bands you don't want. So there is equivalent types of filtering on the LO path as well. So moving back over here, I have, there it is, this is your other multiplier. So here's one multiplier, here's another multiplier, that's how we get all the way to 20 gigahertz. Different filters, you can see again, embedded into the PCB, and these filters are of course here now to filter the, all of the different LO harmonics as well. We have a synthesizer here, this is an LTC6945, I believe this is a 6 gigahertz synthesizer. So the LO signal reference comes through this connector and goes over here. And this allows it to synthesize a whole bunch of other frequencies, going all the way over here, and you can see selectors and switches yet again. So they have a whole bunch of filters on the LO path, just like they have on the RF path, in order to match them together. And the control of this is just a nightmare. So splitting and recombining, and then you can see the LO coming over here. It makes sense. So there is an LO path this way into this IQ mixer, into this IQ mixer, and there's an LO path this way into this IQ mixer and this one. And doubler here, doubler here, so now it becomes fairly clear how this works. And then eventually the IQ signal from this must be reaching this guy, which is identical to this one. This is another dual digital gain control block, which then goes into these four connector. We have differential I and Q. So lots of beautiful work on this PCB. Everything you see here are fast shift registers, so the data to control all of these switches, the synthesizers, the filters, everything just gets shifted into this and it's applied. And this has to run at a rate to support that one terahertz per second sweep. So really quite beautiful. Now one thing people don't often realize is that as you make these PCBs more and more complex and you want to fit them in the same footprint, it becomes much harder because the stack up of the PCB becomes much harder to do and becomes more expensive because you need to have more expensive layers of the PCB. You may need blind vias, you may need more lamination layers and press cycles to get these PCBs done. And yep, these things are not something you just do once and it works right away. I'm sure they must have spent a lot of time getting this to work. I always appreciate to see beautiful engineering like this. And the other side, nothing, there's nothing on that side, a little few passives over here. Here's our differential I and Q. Here's our LO coming in from this connector. And these two are for the digital power and everything else. Yeah, looks really nice. So let's now switch and take a look at the digital sign since we kind of understand how this one works. We know what interfaces to follow. Let's see how the other one looks like. And here is our digital board, and it's just as beautiful. Now, this is the revision A. It's not the B or the C, in fact. So this doesn't have the DRAM that revision B has, and it doesn't have the 10 gigabit Ethernet interface that revision C has. But everything else is essentially the same. So we can start from a few different places. Up here, it's not populated right now, but this is where the OCXO goes. Right next to it, we have a synthesizer. There's an ADF4002. Uh, this obviously operates on the signal that comes directly from the OCXO. The LO architecture of this instrument is quite complex and fairly elegant. Uh, we have a DDS here, so there is a direct digital synthesis component. This is an analog devices AD9911. 
I believe, and or 112, and this one is a 1 giga sample per second uh, DDS with a DAC built into it, so they are synthesizing some of that waveform using this. There are various soft filters, you can see these silver cans over here, various soft filters, it looks like. The two components here I could not identify, which is interesting. Uh, we have another synthesizer here. This one over here is a full PLL, this is an ADF4335. And this one is what generates the LO, the final LO, and you can see the connector on the other side. It even says LO, a test point right here. So this is the connector that goes to the other board. So everything from here is the full synthesized LO that has the sweeping. It goes into another synthesizer on the other board that I showed you, and the combination generates all the different LO frequency. There's an identical TLC, a 6945, I believe, is uh, the other component that was exactly the same on the other board. So there's another synthesizer. There's even a mixer here, which is interesting. So they're, they're doing mixing and combinations of these and various synthesizers to generate this complex LO, not just for the RF board, but also for the main data converter. This is an ADC, AD9680 uh, from analog devices up to 1.25 gigasample per second, 14-bit, really nice uh, dual ADC structure, and of course it has to be dual because we're dealing with I and Q, and right over here we have a JSD interface directly to our main FPGA. This is an Altera Area 10 series, uh, 10AX027. This has a lot of empty space still on it for them to implement future functions. These are really expensive, and I put on the screen the specification for it exactly because I can't remember on top of my head. We have some flash memory here for some firmware. Here's our GPS timing controller right over here. We have a Cypress chip for the USB interface. Uh, we have a whole bunch of these CDC converter sections over here. These linear micro modules are brilliant, but also very expensive for doing the CDC conversion. This entire section is obviously fed from this, which is the main power from 9 to 16 volts, which is also cool because between 9 to 16 volts means that you can easily run this from a battery if you wanted to. So I'm thinking of even making a LiPo battery bank for this and be able to run it you know, off the grid and just have it hooked up to you know, a laptop and you're just basically completely mobile at that point. So it's definitely possible and maybe they will make a battery pack themselves. Uh, you can see some connectors here which would then go into the trigger and the uh, GPS and so on, perhaps the 10 megahertz in and out. Uh, something's supposed to go in here which I can't identify, it's not populated. Uh, let me see what else is interesting here to talk about. Yes, this connector over here is fully weatherized. Look at that. You can see it's fully epoxied in. All the screws are even fully epoxied in. Really nice. This obviously has uh, protection against moisture getting into this, as well as uh, this being big chassis to press against the metal to create even more isolation. Yeah, so the design is obviously all the magic is all the code they have written in the Altera and the software that runs on the PC. But this handles a tremendous amount of data, obviously, to interface with the PC, especially the C revision that has the 10 gig Ethernet. There it is, you know, so very nice design. You can see it has a different finish because this is not an RF board, so it's quite a bit different than the other one. On the other side, we don't really don't have anything, but we have an identical set of IQ inputs and LO output to feed the RF board. Yeah, there it is. So now that we have a, an understanding of how this works internally and what components there are, it's time to do some experiments and see what it can do. So let's start with the SM200C. SignalHound provides a document to help you figure out how you want to connect this 10 gigabit Ethernet to your PC. There are several ways to do it. You can use Thunderbolt 3, you can just use a PCI Express card. Now I wanted to build a PC that, that wasn't mentioned in their document so that I can show you yet another way that you can get 10 gigabit Ethernet up and running. So I created this monstrosity. Uh, this is nothing more than an Intel NUC, but this Intel PC did not have a Thunderbolt on it and it did not have, a, obviously, a PCI Express because it's such a small form factor. But it did have an M2 key interface, and that's typically used for connecting SSDs to the computer. So I removed the SSD from it, and I got this converter, which allows you to convert that M2 key into a PCI Express because they're essentially on the same bus. This is nice and flexible because it means you can connect the ribbon cable, come out of the PC, and then just go into a regular PCIe card, and this is a 10 gigabit ASUS card. This entire setup, not counting the NUC of course, this entire converter and this card, you, know, you can do for about $50. So it's really quite affordable. Now the instrument itself also comes with this uh, fiber-based SFP Plus modules. There are many different kinds of modules. You can even get twisted pair Ethernet for 10 gigabit Ethernet connection as well. But, you know, I'm going to use these ones because this is fiber as well. There's two of these. Both of them came with the instrument as well as the fiber. So here is the setup for our first experiment. I have the SM200C connected with fiber to our computer as I showed you earlier. At the same time, I have a signal coming from the synthesizer directly into the SM200C. And this signal is supposed to be an FMCW sweep. 
but for some reason it is causing a problem, a linearity problem, in a radar transmitter. And we want to analyze this and understand why is it and what is the problem with the signal that's causing some kind of an overload condition that's very difficult to detect. It's hard to know unless we look at it carefully, so let's go to the software and see what we can discover about it. So let's go ahead and take a look at the Spike software, which is the same software Signal Hound uses for all their instruments. And it gives you a nice consistent GUI for all the products here. Now let's go ahead and connect this. Here's our SM200C over Ethernet. It's going to try and connect to that. And we should see the sweep. And there we go. This is a basic spectrum analyzer sweep. We're getting a lot of IF overload conditions. And that's because the IF signal is beyond the dynamic range of the unit. And this instrument is really good at catching that. If you don't catch this, you will be making erroneous results and not even know it. But because this instrument is so fast and captures so many FFTs, you don't, you, it's very unlikely that you would miss these conditions. Let's change the reference here. We can put the reference to 0 dBm. And there we go. So you can see there is a tone in the middle of our sweep. This tone is coming and going. Its frequency is apparently somewhere in the middle of the band, about 10 GHz or so. Let's take a closer look at this frequency. We can do a peak over here. You can see sometimes the peak captures the main tone and sometimes captures the DC offset at the beginning of the band, which all spectrum analyzers have. I can go ahead and change the peak threshold to minus 30, but for some reason, it still captures this one, even though minus 30 is quite a bit higher power than here. So perhaps this is a bug where this peak still finds this tone near DC. But I can do a single capture until I catch the tone that I'm looking for. You can see that it's not very frequent. There we go, here it is. So it's around 9.6 gigahertz. That, that, that already tells us something about where we need to focus our attention. Now, if you want to understand the nature of this tone more, we're gonna need to look at it in real time, which is the, spec which is the strength of this spectrum analyzer. And that, that mode can be accessed from many different analysis modes that are built into this software. But before we do that, let's make sure that our network connection is fast enough to support the kind of speeds we need for 160 megahertz instantaneous bandwidth. So if I go into the network speed test, you can see that we can easily maintain an 8.8 .8 gigabit per second tra transfer rate between the two units, and that is great. It means that 160 megahertz IQ streaming is possible. So let's go and close this, back to the analysis mode, and now we can take it to real time and check it out. I mean, look at how fast this is. This is crazy to see we are sweeping from DC to 20 gigahertz in less than 17 milliseconds. And that's at a, a 300 kilohertz resolution bandwidth. I can lower that to 30 kilohertz and we're still around 17 milliseconds. So that's, that's basically our terahertz per second sweep rate here. Some additional interesting features are emerging now. We see obviously the second harmonic appearing occasionally here. And we can see that the signal amplitude is not fixed and its frequency is certainly not fixed. So it's sweeping back and forth, it does produce some harmonic, it has some amplitude variation. And in order to analyze that further, we need to look even closer at the signal. So let's go ahead and change the center frequency to 9.6 gigahertz, which is where this is supposed to be. And I'm gonna put the span at 500 megahertz. Now please note here that 500 megahertz is wider than 160 and therefore the instrument is doing multiple 160 megahertz captures. And it's doing that now in 724 a microsecond and therefore the POI is 724 microseconds. So events that are as small as that will not be missed. Now some additional information is visible. First of all, we have more power at the ends of the band, which is interesting. Our average which detector type is type of average. You can see that's the white line and the persistence of all the activities in the back. So there's a few other things I can do. Let's enable the channel power. Let's increase the channel power to 100 megahertz. Or actually, maybe even a little bit more. Let's say 120 megahertz. We can see that we have an average of about minus 17, minus 18 dBm of power in this entire band. So that sweep of the signal aggregate during a capture produces that much power. Okay, that's useful. Let's go and disable this back again. We can go ahead under peak table here, and we can enable the peak table, and then let's say put a threshold of, say about minus 45 dBm, okay? If I put a threshold of minus 45, I'm gonna enable that. And now I'm getting a list of a whole bunch of tones here, and I can do a single capture, and look at the list of all the frequencies that this is producing, they're all labeled over here. And this is useful if you have multiple tones happening, coming and going, and you wanna capture and find out the relative power. And this is a pretty useful feature here. And of course, this means that this sweep is happening essentially in discrete and is jumping around uh, in this entire sweep from the beginning to the end. It still doesn't explain what's going on with the end peaks being higher. 
Now there's one other suggestion I had here, uh, depending on how you set this up, so if I increase the resolution bandwidth, sometimes it doesn't capture, capture the tones because the resolution bandwidth is bigger, and you can see that these numbers continue to try and realign. I think it would make more sense if the GUI was changed such that it wouldn't try to auto-fit these left columns so that these numbers don't jump back and forth, which would make them a lot harder to look at. So that's a, a minor change that I'm sure they can, they can perform. Let's go back to 30 kilohertz here. So I'm gonna disable this again, and we're going to now jump closer and look at 160 megahertz bandwidth alone, which is the entire instantaneous capture bandwidth here. So I'm gonna change the span. Let's lower the span to 160. Now in 160 megahertz, right now the LO is no longer sweeping. So we're basically capturing this entire band as fast as we can and streaming it live into the PC. So it's a little bit harder to look at now. We can see all the different tones. If you look at the detector, it's set to average. If I change the detector average to min max, now I can see the minimum and maximum signal powers that are captured within each frequency. I'm going to increase the resolution bandwidth a little bit to make it a little easier to look at. Here we go, at 300 kilohertz, now we're getting a lot more information. First of all, it looks like that the signal has a nice start, that it does not go beyond the bandwidth it's supposed to. So it never goes to the left of this edge. But on the right side, it seems that when the signal stops, that we get some time where the signal goes beyond the bandwidth of the capture, and that's why you get this spectral leakage. Now this could be because of the FFT length, or it could be from the instrument itself, and we can find out once we do further analysis on it. So there's a point of interest to go back and look at. It's very clear also that the signal has more power sometimes at the beginning of the sweep, and that's maybe the problem that I was referring to earlier where we fail the mask of this signal as it sweeps. So that's another place to look at. Otherwise, the signal amplitude is fairly flat. You can see minimum, maximum, uh, fairly flat throughout the entire bandwidth. I can put markers on this. I can put the marker here on the left side. I can remove the peak tracking of the marker, bring it to the edge here. That's our first marker. Let's make another marker. I'm gonna activate that marker as well and put that marker at the end. You can see that our we're going from 9.55 to 9.65. That's a 100 megahertz of sweep that, is, that this signal has. So that's additional information. Let's go ahead and change that back to average. Now on average, we see that at the ends, the signal have higher power than they do in the middle. And this, what does that mean? Well, they could mean that the signal spends more time at the ends of the bandwidth rather than the middle, and therefore there's more accumulated power at the ends. So you can see just by playing with different settings of the software and how you capture and analyze, you can get a lot more information. The ultimate test is to look at this signal in the time domain. And because we have 160 megahertz of capture, we can now go back into a new mode of operation and look at the signal as a function of time as a, rather than as a function of frequency. I'm gonna change the analysis mode once again. You're gonna to go to zero span. And in zero span, we now get some additional capabilities from the unit. First of all, we're still looking at 9.6 gigahertz center. We still have an IF bandwidth of 160 megahertz. We're capturing about one milliseconds worth of data. I'm gonna change that to 15 milliseconds. So we're capturing a, a lot longer duration of signal. So this is now obviously coming and going depending on when the triggering happens. Right now the triggering is an immediate trigger. So it triggers as fast as it can. And you can see a lot of things happening here, but that, that's not very useful because we need to capture this when the signal is present. Otherwise, we're spending a lot of our memory basically doing nothing. So I'm going to change the trigger type uh, to trigger uh, type from immediate trigger to video trigger. And I'm going to put the video trigger threshold somewhere, in the, somewhere around where the signal starts. Let's say about minus 20 dBm. There we go. So we can enter that properly and check it out. So now we are capturing precisely when the signal starts. We're capturing the entire duration the signal is there and then stopping. Remember this, at the here now the x-axis is in time. So we see clearly that something is wrong at the beginning. The signal starts, the amplitude is way higher than it should be, then it falls down and then starts going flat and then it disappears. But perhaps even more interestingly, if I look at the frequency versus time, we can see that the signal spends quite a long time at the beginning, staying at this first initial frequency, ramps up nicely and linearly, and then spends a little bit more time at the end before it disappears. So this is why the beginning and the end have higher average power, like you can see right here and right here, than they do in the middle, because the signal spends more time there. And if I look here at the waterfall, I'm gonna change the number of FFTs to even higher. Let's do 2048 FFTs. 
So you can see that the number changed. I'm going to go to the very beginning of our waterfall. And look at that. You can see that at the very beginning, the frequency is not stable. And then once it stabilizes, it begins to sweep. This would mean that if I zoom around at the very beginning, I should see some instability in the center frequency. I'm going to right click over here. I'm going to go enable the zoom. And I'm going to zoom right here. And check it out. That's exactly what is happening. So by looking at the waterfall, I realized that, first of all, the frequency when the sweep starts is not stable. It stabilizes after some time, and I can measure exactly how long that is because I have it here on the x-axis. Then it's nice and flat. It continues all the way to the end, and then eventually at the end it disappears. And Oops, let me do another auto zoom over here. Go back, and you can see it's all the way to the end. It's fairly stable. Now, one thing this software, I think, absolutely needs is to be able to drag and move the waveform around because right now it doesn't have that capability. If I want to zoom in, I have to do a right click and then when I let go, and if I want to, let's say, go to the left or the right or span left and right, I, I can't do that. It just keeps zooming in. So that, I think, is an absolute must and it will be even more useful in another experiment we will be doing. You'll see why. So, okay, that 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 basically tells us everything we need to know about the nature of how this signal behaves. We understand why the beginning and the end have more power. We see that the frequency has some instability at the beginning. But also, if I zoom over here, oh, I need to enable that again. If I zoom over here, I can clearly see that the signal goes way up before it comes back down. Let's go zoom in there. And look at that. This is a classic second order response. Now, this is obviously from the ALC loop of the synthesizer. When the synthesizer initially enables the output, it takes some time for the amplitude leveling circuitry to do its thing and to level the output power. And this overshoot and then coming back and then stabilizing is a second order response of the synthesizer. So all of this I just did simply by analyzing the signal that was captured by the spike software. And this, you can imagine how powerful it is. And without these tools, you would never capture these problems. So here in our second experiment, we have a mystery transmitter here. This mystery transmitter is using some frequency modulation and some frequency hopping. We don't know anything about it. We want to discover how it works. Now, to make matters more complicated, I have taken the output of this, added it to the input of the SM200C, but simultaneously, I'm also taking the output of a synthesizer over here and adding it to the same signal. And I've configured the synthesizer to act like an interfering signal on top of the signal coming from our RF transmitter. So you can imagine that this is becomes a fairly complex situation because you have two unknown signals on top of each other and you're trying to isolate and analyze the signal from the unknown transmitter. So let's go to the software and see how we can do that. So let's go ahead and analyze this signal now. Now here's our transmitter. It's clearly jumping around. You can see it's not a very good transmitter. It doesn't have good filtering. It's producing quite a bit of harmonic outside of what it's supposed to. Its amplitude is still fairly high and it's jumping around. So this is a fairly rapidly varying signal because it uses frequency hopping as part of the communication protocol. So catching an interference on this signal is really difficult. Right now the interference is not enabled, but I want to use the interference hunting function of this instrument and try and catch it. So first of all, let's go directly into the interference hunting mode over here. And there's an IF overload condition here again. I'm going to change this amplitude to zero. And we can see indeed this is running all over the place and our center frequency is 2.45 gigahertz. That's where our transmitter is supposed to be operating. I'm going to put that there. I'm going to change the span to 500 megahertz. Remember this 500 megahertz is again larger than 160. So we're looking at multiple captures. So the LO is sweeping as well. And I'm going to change the sweep time to something longer. And the reason I do this is because I want to make sure I catch the full communication protocol from end to end, and I also catch multiple channels. So it's very obvious now where the frequency hopping is happening. So these channels are all over the place. This transmitter is rapidly firing packets. And you can see over here at the top on the spectrogram that the behavior is fairly periodic. And this is normal because this frequency hopping is not encrypted. So it's jumping in a fairly predictable way. And this allows the receiver to essentially follow it. Okay, that's great. So how do we find out if there is an interference? Well, I'm going to have to prime the system to catch it first. So first, let's go over here and change to the max hold. And let's go ahead and capture 10 seconds worth of data, which means that this is going to listen for 10 seconds of duration, get an idea of what kind of signals are present normally, and then any interfering signal outside of that will be caught. Now, in a real system, an interference may be very infrequent. It may not happen all the time, so you can capture multiple different acquisitions and then find the one where the interference is not present. There are lots of ways to do this. For us, I've just made it simple for demonstration. Let's go ahead and acquire a baseline. 
So now it's going to measure 10 seconds. It's going to look at all of this, store it, and then we're going to get a green baseline. That's going to be our basically a repeated pattern that we see. There it is. Here's a repeated pattern. So for as long as our signal is within this boundary, it's considered not to have any interference on top of it. But I'm going to go ahead and enable our interfering signal now. And here it is. As you can clearly see, the interfering signal lies outside of that, and every time it happens, we catch it. And as soon as it's caught, we're getting an event which lists every condition this interference was violating. So let's do a single here. So there was nothing here. Let's do another one. There is one right there, you can see. And it's caught it. It's at 2.61 gigahertz. Its bandwidth is given, its power is given, and its duration is given. You can see its duration is zero because it's such a short-lived signal. But it's still caught even though it has a very, very small duration. So you can keep doing this and catch all. another one here is another one and I can continue this and eventually we will see one more. There it is, right in the middle of the band. So this interference hunting can be really useful if your signal is infrequent but also your actual signal that you're interested in is very complex and to build a baseline. Now this is nice but this doesn't tell us anything about the nature of the signal itself. What I want to do is now analyze the communication protocol and see if we can even decode the bits that are being transmitted. So to do that, let's put this back to auto over here and let's change the mode back on to real time. And you can see all the activity here. Once again, I'm going to ch change the center frequency to 2.45 gigahertz and we're going to change the span to 160. There it is. So it's very clear where our signals are. And now these are all the different channels. You can see it hits these different channels periodically. So we can find out what channels it's using and trigger on the channel that we're interested in. Now triggering on a channel is very different than tr triggering on a power. Because all, if I were relying on just power, then I could periodically catch different channels. Let's try that out and see how that looks like. Let's go on to zero span mode. Here's a zero span mode, and right now our triggering is, to, is in immediate trigger. Let's capture it a little bit longer. Let's capture five milliseconds here. So you can see different packets coming in, and the behavior of the transmitter is fairly interesting. You can see it starts up, it dwells for a bit, ramps up the power, and then continues sending some power, which we don't know anything about yet, and then it drops, and it goes to the next next packet. The packets are not all of the same length. Their spacing is all, all random. So catching this is going to be difficult. Let's go back to auto. So every time this thing sweeps and catches a 5 millisecond duration, it is going to catch a different channel. But if I want to find one specific channel, I'm going to trigger using something called frequency mask trigger. Now there is a frequency mask editor over here. I'm going to open that. And what this allows me to do is allows me to create a mask precisely where I want it so that if a signal is within the mask, it does a trigger. So you can see how useful that is because you can now isolate an individual channel. And I'm going to erase all these points and start with my own. You can, by the way, also build from a sweep. So there you go. Now I just built one from the sweep and you can see that anything outside of this will now create a trigger. But this is not really what we're looking for in this case because the signal just jumps around too much. So this outside of this mask doesn't really help that much. So let's go ahead and clear all the points again. Let's add one point, two point, three points, and I'm going to drag these points out like that. And I'm going to try and catch one of these tones only. So let's say the one that's over here that I can see jumping in the middle every once in a while. I'm going to make a fairly narrow band here, like so. And then bring it over here. Is this a good spot? Yeah, this looks like a, roughly a good spot. So I should be able to catch this repeatedly. So let me go ahead and click OK. And I'm going to change this from intermediate to this one. There you go. Look at that. So now it only catches whenever the signal is on that channel and nothing else. And this is super useful because we can see how the signal behaves. First of all, we can see how often it's on this channel, but also not to catch all the other tones. You can also see how useful this is in the presence of interference because interference may be jumping around. You don't want to trigger on those. You may want to trigger on a very infrequent event, which is your protocol that you're trying to transmit. And this is yet another really handy triggering system that's built into this. Now what I really want to see is more advanced triggering aside from amplitude and frequency mask. I want to be able to trigger on phase and on frequency as well because these two additional triggers are very useful for things like PLL design or for some system that has a wide frequency sweep for radar applications. So FM and uh, PM would definitely be a advan uh, big advantage to add over here. So let's go and see what we can do about this. Let's do a single capture here. 
So we have several packets. And let's zoom in here, like so. And let's see what do we see. Well, it's clear that there is some time at the very beginning where the signal is fixed in frequency. It's trying to catch the right frequency, so there's some locking cycle. It looks like some kind of a PLL potentially. And it waits for some time. And then, if you look over here, let me zoom some further, it's very obvious and it's sending some data. These are different bits. And since we are in FM versus time, this is an FM modulated signal. So we should be able to capture the bits by analyzing how the frequency is changing over time. Now this is very noisy. And the reason it's noisy is because the FM modulation, the depth of the FM modulation is really small. It's like one and a half, two megahertz. But we're looking at 160 megahertz bandwidth. So there's a lot of capture that's totally wasted. Eating to our dynamic range, we don't need that. So we should be able to change that fairly easily. Let's go back to an auto zoom. Let's look at another one. You can see it has exactly the same behavior. Lock, stay for a bit, send a single tone, start sending data and stop. So I'm gonna go ahead and change some of the settings to be able to capture precisely this FM modulation. So I have reduced the sample rate to 25 mega sample per second and an IF bandwidth of 20 megahertz. Here's our tone. I have also modified the triggering and here's the different packets. So let's do a single, single capture here and zoom into here for a closer look. And now it is much more clear and we can individually see all the bits because we're capturing a much smaller bandwidth. You can also see in the spectrogram how much time the signal spends at different frequency, a burst in the center, that's for locking, and then you have the data distribution. So it looks really nice. So this was fairly easy to do, again, because of the functionality that's built into this. There are other measurements we can add here, such as phase versus time, uh, CCDF is another one that tells you how often your signal spends uh, with a certain amount of power within the entire capture. So all of these you can do in IQ polar plots. There's just so much time if I want to go over every one of these. But this also, this instrument is also capable of doing demodulation both in analog and in digital. So let's do a demodulation experiment. And here's the setup for our next experiment. This is actually a super heterodyne transmitter. We have a mixer here and down here that's quite small. And the output of the mixer, the RF, is connected to the SM200C. We have the LO coming from here and the IF from coming here. Now the IF itself is centered at 4 gigahertz. The LO here is centered at 12 gigahertz, producing an RF of 16 gigahertz. But of course, there's no image rejection here at all. There's no filter. So we will be able to see the IF leakage, the LO leakage, as well as both of the images above and below the 12 gigahertz LO we have here. I have the IF coming from a key side source up there. That's going to do our modulation for us as well. So we should be able to now analyze and see if we can demodulate the signal as well as look at various characteristics of this mixer. And here's the signal coming from the mixer. There are quite a few tones as a result of IF leakage, LO leakage, and we can analyze them all at the same time looking at the peak frequencies. Obviously the upper image is the one we're interested in. That's the 16 gigahertz one, which is the IF plus LO. All the other tones are undesired. The 8 gigahertz signal, the 4 gigahertz signal, which is the IF leakage, the 12 gigahertz, the LO leakage, and so on. But because we're using two sinusoids currently, there's no modulation in the IF and no modulation in the LO, so we should be able to measure the phase noise of the combined signals. This is important because the phase noise of both of those are now sitting on top of each other. Let's go ahead over here and measure phase noise. And I'm going to set this to a 16 gigahertz carrier. Up here, this measurement you're seeing is from the previous measurement done. And you should ca capture that. There it is. It's locked onto it. And it says the carrier is minus 8 dBm, which is correct. And we can see very clearly the phase noise response. And this phase noise response has a classic uh, behavior that you would see from a synthesizer. There's a, some minor tone sitting on top of it. Now, one of the other things I would like to see is perhaps a stop frequency above 10 megahertz, maybe 20 or 50 megahertz. Sometimes it's useful to see beyond the 10 megahertz region, especially when you're calculating jitter. And I can enable the jitter as well. There you go, it's telling me that the accumulated jitter in RMS is 93 fem to second between 20 kilohertz and 10 megahertz summed up. So that looks good. Now this has no modulation on it, that's why I can measure the phase noise. But if I want to measure the modulation, I go back over sweep here. I can go ahead and enable the modulation. There it is. So you can see the modulation sitting on top of it. So I can go in real time and actually take a close look to make sure that my modulation looks correct. Center frequency is 16 gigahertz once again. And we're going to reduce the span to as small as possible. And there it is. Here's a modulation, how fast it sweeps again. It looks nice. Now I want to demodulate and get the raw bits out or find out how good the constellation is. Or I can also do that in the software because we do have digital modulation analysis built into here. 
So I've already set it up. And here's our 64 QAM signal. Here's the spectrum, the eye diagrams from I and Q, and of course EVM percentage versus the number of symbols. I'm capturing 2048 symbols to ensure there are enough of them to statistically capture a good EVM characteristic. Now there's a lot of other measurements here you can also add, of course, but in order to keep it simple, let's only look at these and we have the symbols coming out. Now if you look at this system, because of the bandwidth limitations and the phase and the frequency response of the cables, of the mixers and so on, we're going to get an EVM that looks like this. Now if you look at this, you may think that this is because of Gaussian noise, but it isn't. This is simply because of the fact that this is unequalized and there's a lot of phase and frequency response that needs to be corrected for. It's essentially ISI. So I can go ahead and enable the equalization, which this guy can do. There we go. If I enable that, it's going to start doing equalization and it's showing me the equalization response. And it's not even that much. If you look, you're only really doing about 1 dB of peaking up here and then going down about 0.4 dB. And this is the entire plus or minus 50 megahertz bandwidth that we're looking at. And if you look, this is already significantly better. Our EVM has now dropped to about 2%. If you look, the outer points are larger, and this is partially because all these sources are unlocked. So during the 2048 symbols, the IF and the LO frequency can drift with respect to each other. They're not locked, and as you capture a longer long symbol, you're going to see that. Some of it also just has to do with phase noise. So it's nice to see all of this built into this, especially with the equalization. You can search and sync and find out what patterns you're sending, especially when you're doing modulation, and also as well as analog and other formats. This can be pretty handy. And there's a lot more that you can do here. And for the interest of time, I'm not going to go through every single bit, but you can do EMC pre-compliance, set your own limits and catch out of band emissions and figure out if something is passing basic EMC compliance tests. You can also do things like emission mask test, which is similar in some ways, as well as the wireless LAN 802.11 AB and NAC full decoding with the streaming built into the Spike software. But perhaps where something like this really shines is in the API. Because once you have the API and they provide that free download, you can write your own code in Python, C, or MATLAB, whatever you want, and it allows you to capture the 160 megahertz bandwidth, including the SM200B model, which you cannot do full streaming, but you can capture a full two seconds, as I described earlier. And not only that, once you have the raw data, then you can write any code you want. In fact, there are quite a few third-party software that are built around this and you can go ahead and check on their website and all of these companies have written software that's compatible with Signal Hounds instruments and you can even do your own AI and ML algorithms on top of it if you have a very complex RF spectrum and you want to analyze it and, and recognize some particular pattern. So really the instrument becomes more powerful when it is compatible with all these third-party softwares and if you are a customer of these companies of course you can use them. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed the review of these instruments. Uh, these reviews do take quite a long time. I do my best to present the instruments as they are with their advantages and disadvantages so you get a good idea of what kind of instrument you should buy for your lab. And if you do happen to purchase something like this, please let Signalhound know that you watched my video. I get no benefit from that. All the links that I provide to the manufacturer's website are direct links. They're not even tracked. So really, I want to make sure that you make the best purchase that is good for your lab. And talking with, with the vendor uh, keeps a good relationship between my lab and theirs of course uh, in terms of performance yeah these things are great as you saw from the experiments this is basically an ultimate software defined radio with the code being able to be written on the raw streaming data coming from these you can develop some pretty fantastic software and do some fascinating examination and reverse engineering of some of the RF signals that are coming over the air so it's really good I'm gonna definitely use them in the lab more often and write some custom code for it and if you like it let me know in the comment section I'll see you next time